fundamental question. Yes, that's why a lot of us have ontological anxiety. It's that question. What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? What's it all for? Then that is also why God has told us and given us revelation to say, well, this is why I created you. And again, my assertion is the only way to reach certainty is when the one who created us and the one who brought us into existence says, I created you for this purpose. So the Quran says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَى لِيَعْبُدُونَ Which means that God is saying, I did not create the humans, sorry, I did not create the jinn and the human being except to worship me. I'm going to come back to this. There are many, many other passages in the Quran. Let's take Surah Al-Fatiha. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ You alone do we worship. Let's take Surah Al-Baqarah, the 21st verse. O mankind, worship your sustainer who has created you and those who lived before you so that you may be conscious of him. Okay, third surah, 51. Verily, God is my sustainer as well as your sustainer, so worship him alone. This is the straight way. And surah number 5, verse 76. Say, would you worship besides God something that has no power either to harm you or to benefit you when God alone is all hearing, all knowing? And many, many other verses Many, about 200 and something when I, you know, uh, looked for this term worship. What does this term worship mean? People may think, oh, so what, I just exist just to pray, to fast, you know, to whatever. No, this is a very narrow, secularized definition of the term worship, which the word ibadah does not mean. Ibadah is a much more comprehensive term in Arabic. It means everything which God is loved and pleased with, Everything which God loves and is pleased with from the actions of the heart and the actions of the limbs. So the purpose of life is to try to do everything in a way that God loves and God is pleased with. Whether it is the action of your heart like love, hope, fear, trust, reliance or reverence, intention, sincerity. These are actions of the heart or actions of the limbs, the things you do, the things you say to try and do them in a way that God loves and God is pleased with. How can we know what God loves? How can we know what God is pleased with? Again, we go back to our door analogy. It is not something we can guess. It's not something we can only guess through reason. We need revelation. That is why God has sent the prophets to tell you this is the purpose of life and then to teach us how to fulfill that created purpose. Okay. So we have not been created except to worship Allah. And concerning this as well, Abdullah ibn Abbas said, to worship God means to know God. So this is very important. We have been created to know God. How can we know God? How can we know God? Think about this. Sometimes, many times, perhaps always, the only way you can truly know something is by comparing it with its opposite. Let me give you a simple example. If on this wall here, I painted a white dot, and I said to you all, do you like my white dot that I've painted? <laughs> Could you tell me where it is, you know? But if, I, if the whole wall was black, and then I painted a white dot, you'd be able to identify it quickly, wouldn't you? You see, this is the reality. How do we know what is goodness if there is not evil? How do we know what is order if there is not randomness? How do we know what is health if there is not sickness? How do we know what is sin if there is not good deeds? How do we know what is eternal and infinite and self-sufficient if we do not experience its opposite, i.e. that which is temporary and finite and needy. And therefore, the universe is created in order for us to be able to realize and understand the lofty attributes, the perfect attributes of the Creator. These attributes are revealed again in the Revelation. 
God tells us because again we can't guess what these attributes are. There is a very limited knowledge that we can have about God through reason. But the attributes of God, the qualities of God, again this can only be known through revelation. So through the revelation then one begins to contemplate these attributes and one begins to see how they are manifest in the creation. And I would like to give you one example. I would like to give you one example. There, I, I suppose I could give many, and since there are 99 famous ni names of God, it would take us quite a long time to go through them all. But I'd like to give one example of al ghafur the forgiving, which by the way also neatly ties in with what I'm talking about the whole uh, topic today. Okay? al ghafur the forgiving. The Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said something it is a really extraordinary thing that he said. It's, it's really something very deep. He said that if you did not sin and then ask God for forgiveness for your sins, then God would remove you and he would bring, bring another people who did sin and they would ask God forgiveness for their sins and then God would forgive them. And what is deep about this? And it is not an invitation for human beings to sin, but it is an explanation of the reality. Number one, that human beings will sin. But number two, and importantly, is through recognizing that you have done something in opposition to what God has commanded. And through your knowing that God is displeased with that, <clears throat> but you also know that you have a Lord who is forgiving and who is merciful and who accepts repentance. And so through this process of recognizing your sin, repenting for your sin, you understand the reality of al ghafur the forgiving. How else could you understand the reality that God is a forgiving God, if you, that God is a forgiving God, if you did not sin and then seek forgiveness for your sins? How will you comprehend the reality of it? So therefore, these things are inevitable. They must be part of our life. Through them and by them, we come to realize and we come to understand all of this suffering the existence of evil, all of these things, that is part of this tapestry of life through which and by which we can realize and understand truth. Number, point number three I want to make, that life is a test. The Quran says in Surah Al-Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ Which means that God has created death and life to make known which of you is the best in conduct and he is the forgiving, the merciful. This is a huge topic in and of itself. But life is a test to make known which of us will obey and which of us will disobey. Which of us will follow God's guidance and which of us will turn away from God's guidance. It also implies that life is a struggle. Life is a struggle. Struggle is inbuilt into life. Mankind has been created in toil and struggle. Yet it is through that toil and through that struggle and through that whole process of facing difficulties and challenges that we become either better human beings or in fact we become worse human beings. And this by the way illustrates the important point of how relative the concept of evil is. Because if we take the example of an earthquake, let's say, let's say right now in here there was an earthquake and this building fell down. For some people, this may be a great calamity. It may be the end of their life. They may become disabled. Many terrible things. Their friends may die. They may lose all hope of life. Yet there are other people in this room who almost certainly will rise to the challenge of the occasion that they will display acts of bravery and courage and selflessness and altruism. There will even be those people who suffer loss. But through it and through overcoming that loss, they become better human beings. And this is the reality. In fact, this is the reality of our everyday life. 
In fact, even at university, you're suffering.